Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about the impact of plastic. This might seem like a very self-explanatory video and I've generally used the impact series to talk about some of the impact of things that you might not have known about, but I guess most people today are aware that plastic is not amazing and I think we've heard a lot about how plastic is bad so perhaps this video is a little bit self-explanatory but I really wanted to make something that sort of explained the basics of why this whole channel even exists and I've also gotten a lot of requests from you guys that when you're talking to climate change deniers or generally skeptics it's nice to have some nice well-formulated ammunition so I hope that you'll be able to use this video to sort of gather some facts and some overview that you can use to talk about these things in another context. I hope that makes sense. I'm really excited to talk about plastic because back in 2015 when I first encountered the expression zero waste the physical trash and plastic was what inspired me to stop this whole thing to begin with. Ah! But since my journey began in 2015, I've also learned that living sustainably is not only about what you put in your bin. I don't believe in the trash jar anymore and I haven't for quite some time. I also don't believe that people can be 100% zero waste, aka I don't think people can generate zero trash whatsoever. I don't think that's realistic. That's also not what this is about. And the term zero waste for me relates more to the goal rather than the actual practice. So. What I do believe in is conscious consuming, consuming less, refusing certain items, reducing other things and generally just giving a damn. With all that being said, the plastic issue is something that we have to take seriously because we're drowning in it. So let's go. About 95 to 99% of all plastic comes from crude oil. Crude oil or fossil fuels are made from ancient bacteria and organisms as well as plants and algae and bigger animals and their biological components. So you can actually say that plastic contains dinosaurs. The creation of crude oil has taken millions of years, during which the organic matter has been transformed into a carbon-rich substance. And oil can be found everywhere in the world, but some specific areas have more abundant amounts of oil than others. To extract oil, we use a process called fracking, and perhaps you've heard this before, but fracking has an impact that is quite frankly ridiculous. It emits insane amounts of CO2 and methane, and methane is another greenhouse gas that is 20 times more potent than CO2. Fracking also pollutes groundwater and destroys natural habitats. Yeah, no thank you fam. Through a process called cracking, crude oil as well as ethane, which is a natural gas which is formed the same way as crude oil, is turned into ethylene, which is one of the primary components we use in plastic production. The impact of producing plastic primarily comes from these emissions, but the impact of plastic in general goes far beyond its production and the resources it requires to make it. So let's continue. Although plastic does actually have some really important purposes, like in the medical industry or in the construction industry and as a tool for disabled people, but Plastic is still overused and overconsumed by a lot of people where it's not necessary at all. On average, we use a piece of plastic for around 12 minutes before discarding it, but it's going to stay here forever. As a result of plastic overconsumption, approximately 8,300 million metric tons of virgin plastic has been produced to date, or since we started mass production 70 years ago. Yeah, 8,000. 300 million metric tons of plastic. 9% of which have been recycled, 12% have been incinerated and 79% is still accumulating in landfills. So it's crap for the planet, but at least it's safe for us, right? Well, there are many different types of plastic and some of them are considered relatively safe, whilst others actually release harmful chemicals under certain circumstances. Plastic types like PET, HDPE, PVC, LDPE and PS can contain BPA. Wow, that was just a, a, lot, of, a lot of letters. Okay, 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 okay. BPA is also called bisphenol A. It's a substance that disrupts hormones. They also react poorly to heat and long-term exposure to sunlight. PS, for instance, is a plastic type that's used for many different things. One of them being these like soft foam, fast food, takeout containers. And the funny thing about PS, I don't know if it's funny, it's concerning at least, is that when it's exposed to heat, 
for instance through warm food it releases a component or a substance called styrene and styrene is a known carcinogen let's put that in fast food containers right <laughs> A good rule of thumb is generally that if you can smell plastic, then it's already releasing toxins and they are already inside your body. And one of the more concerning things about this is actually that if you think about the types of plastic that smells the most like plastic, it's usually toys, toys that children put in their mouths. It's super duper toxic. Oh, thank you. This is where it gets tricky. I've heard countless brands and companies and spokespeople and politicians and influencers say things like plastic is fine as long as it's recycled or at least it's being recycled and plastic is bad for sure but not if it's recycled. Well there are tons of variables and challenges when it comes to plastic recycling. One of the more um, pressing issues is the fact that plastic cannot be recycled forever. In contrast to materials like aluminium and glass, they can be recycled forever in a closed loop, never losing quality and never decreasing in quality. But plastic can actually only be recycled between two to three times. And even when it is recycled, it's often actually downcycled. So let's break this recycling process down. First of all, we need to sort and categorize the plastic because not all plastic types can be recycled together and some can't be recycled at all. When the consumer has sorted the plastic, it's sent to a recycling facility that uses infrared technologies to sort the plastic again, so it becomes as clean as possible. There are certain things like black plastic that generally can't be recycled because it does not register in the optic sorting system. When the plastic is as uniform and clean as possible, it's ground and melded into plastic pellets and these can be used to make new products. But a plastic container is most likely not going to be turned into an identical plastic container. Instead, it's used to make products like synthetic plastic filling for winter coats and sleeping bags or shopping bags. This process of gradually decreasing the value of a product along with its recyclability is called downcycling. Recycling means that you have a product and you turn it into a material and then you turn that material into a new product. Downcycling means that you have a product, you turn it into a material and you turn that material into a worse product or a less valuable product. Whereas upcycling means that you have a product, you turn it into a material and you turn that material into a better or more valuable product. So if you're interested and curious about the recycling options near you, then find out where your local recycling station is and they usually have lots of information about what you can and can't recycle. So that's always a good idea. This should be used sort of like a reference work, how it generally works. But of course there's no such thing as a general thing because usually recycling facilities are outsourced to private companies and might be completely different from place to place so okay <laughs> yowza so why isn't plastic recycling working well one of the more pressing reasons is quantity consumers today generate so much trash and way too much so so much that most recycling stations aren't able to keep up with demand as a result many western companies and recycling facilities are actually outsourcing their waste management to other countries halfway around the world in Denmark we talk a bit game about how we use our waste to produce energy and heat and how that's amazing and how we don't have open landfills and it's cool and although we do actually use waste to energy incinerator plants we also outsource our waste management and large amount of it to open landfills in Poland and Malaysia and Denmark is not the only country this happens constantly all around the globe Perhaps it's also important just to mention that recycling facilities and recycling options vary so much depending on what area, region or country that you're in. So some of these things might be a little bit different where you live. Perhaps I can recycle more or less than where you live. So just always keep that in mind. When plastic has gone through recycling two to three times, it's often too weak, soft or brittle to be used as new material again. So we add virgin plastic to the mix to maintain the quality level. So even when you're recycling plastic, you're actually still using new plastic. To reach the desired and ideal level of sustainability, we cannot solely rely on recycling. Does recycling have to be a part of the solution? Yeah, most definitely. But I've seen just so many politicians and generally people who represent the public talk about how we need to be more sustainable and that always involves more recycling and better recycling and better recycling definitely but we can't solve the waste issue with recycling only because the technology is simply just not there yet 
So once we recycle something, we also have to reduce our impact simply by reducing the amount of products that we throw out or use as waste. And one of the ways are, of course, to use reusable products rather than disposable single-use products obviously. But I just really wanted to mention that although recycling is a good place to start, it's a very, very bad place to stop and it does not solve our waste issue at all. I also really want to add that I and many other people are talking about recycling and sustainability as though the responsibility falls solely on the consumer. And that is, of course, 71% of all global emissions are caused by the same 100 companies and those companies have big roles to play in the waste problem as well. So it is not only the consumer's fault, it is super, super unfair that a lot of the responsibility falls in the consumer because compared to billion dollar companies, we do not have a lot of power to change things unless we change things together and we vote with our money and that's all really important. But it's also fair to sometimes feel as though it's a little bit unfair that we have to do all the things while billion dollar companies just produce waste like it's nobody's business. It is unfair. It's intensely unfair. Normally I would stop my impact videos after the recycling disposal part and then go straight to the conclusion. But with plastic that's not really an option because it's here forever. Plastic is here to stay because it's made out of a fossil material that will never biodegrade but only degrade into smaller bits of plastic aka microplastic. <laughs> microplastic could be its own video in and of itself. There's a lot to talk about and there's a lot to go over. So for this purpose, I'm just going to say that microplastic is what happens to plastic when it biodegrades, when it decomposes. It just becomes smaller bits of plastic. The first thing I learned when I started my zero waste journey was that every bit of plastic I ever used still exists and that is terrifying. The thing is, even when we use incinerators and burn plastic, it's still not disappearing. There are these filters in the incinerators that sort of make sure that particles and smoke and, you know, plastic won't go up into the air and that's all very nice. But I asked someone working at one of these incinerators once what happens to the filters and there aren't really any good solutions to what to do with those filters because they're actually quite toxic. So what we do is that we bury them underground in lack of better solutions. So even when we burn waste and even when we burn plastic, there is still waste left and we still don't know what to do with it. When it comes to landfill, plastic is left outside exposed to wind and weather and aha, sunlight and what happens over time is that the plastic will become weak soft and brittle and start to emit co2 and methane but plastic in landfills will also cause groundwater pollution because it will leak and release toxic chemicals as well landfills are generally just tombs for trash because nothing will ever biodegrade it can take up to three years for a simple carrot to decompose because there's no air plastic pollution in our oceans is also a huge problem for nature, for animals, and yeah, for us. There are several ways where plastic can end up in our oceans. One of the reasons is that it simply just flies out of bins. So even if you've thrown it out in an open bin, like with no lid, it can float, it can fly out and it can pollute that way. It can also be dragged out by seagulls, or other creatures and animals, and that's also a risk. But people also sometimes throw trash, AKA dingbats, and sometimes Global corporations also dump trash, aka bigger dingbats. Can I say dingbat? I don't know who I'm asking. It's estimated that about one truckload's worth of plastic ends up in our oceans every single minute. Every single minute of every day, constantly, always. And a lot of this trash is consumer trash from all over the world. And the thing is, plastic is rather light, which means that it floats. So in the ocean, it's going to gather because we have currents that will sort of function as a huge centrifuge and gather the waste into one big pile of waste. And we call those piles of waste garbage island. The biggest one being the Great Pacific Garbage Patch located in AHA, the Pacific Ocean, and it's three times the size of France. What is even worse about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and smaller garbage patches as well is that they can actually be seen from space, but they're often edited out of satellite photos and completely legally as well, because they are not classified as an organic landmass. 
Consumer waste accounts for about 49% of trash in our oceans, but that category covers a huge amount of daily waste products that we all know from our everyday lives. A study from the EU found that these are the top 10 consumer waste products that end up in our oceans. Number one is water bottles and lids. Number two are cigarette butts. Number three, cotton swabs. Number four, candy wrappers and snack bags. Number five, hygiene products like tampons, pads, and insertion sleeves. Number six, plastic bags. Number seven, single-use cutlery and straws. Number eight, plastic cups and lids. Number nine, balloons and balloon sticks. And number 10, plastic containers like fast food packaging. To combat plastic waste in the oceans, many places has introduced straw bands, but it's actually quite counterproductive to demonize one tiny, tiny plastic product while completely ignoring the big picture. Straws on their own only account for 0.025% of the world's 8 million tons of plastic pollution. And if you want to know more about the consequences of straw bands, you can watch my eco-ableism video, which is linked down below. When it comes to ocean plastic, the largest uniform category of waste belongs to the fishing industry. 20% of ocean plastic comes from ghost gear, like lines, traps, nets, ropes, etc. that are left behind or dumped by fishing boats. So if you're interested in reducing ocean plastic, not eating fish is a really great place to start. Many people today are over consuming and overusing plastic and that of course needs to stop. There's so many plastic products that we use out of convenience even though we don't really need to. But we also need to keep the industries that make the plastic responsible. And if you want to know more about that specific subject, you can watch my video on greenwashing where I'm talking a lot about these dingbat companies. <laughs> because it is intensely unfair that a company can produce plastic like there's no tomorrow but the consumer is the one that is is left with all the responsibility of the impact. I mean like no, 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 no. There are tons of ways to minimize plastic and I think that we should, but we should also look at the big picture sometimes. Plastic packaging only accounts for a very small part of a product's impact. So if you're trying to reduce plastic but you simply can't refuse it altogether, or perhaps you want to take out someday and it comes with plastic, don't beat yourself up. That solves absolutely nothing. Well, we can stop supporting the companies that create the waste in the first place, and we can look at the entire impact of a product rather than only packaging. I know we just thought that sustainability was easy and plastic was bad and everything else was good, but alas, it is more complicated and nuanced than that, and no one is able to be perfect. And I don't mean this to be discouraging because, of course, reducing plastic is part of it, but again, more things I, you know... I prefer other materials like recycled aluminium or glass or cardboard and I will choose those materials any day if I'm presented with an option to choose. Before we're done, here are some final last tips that you can do to reduce your plastic and reduce your impact. First of all, pick up trash you find in nature or on your street anywhere. If it's left on the ground, then pick it up and throw it away. You can also bring your own reusables such as cutlery and plates whenever you go out to a place like a picnic and you know there are going to be disposables there because using a reusable product over a single-use disposable product is always more sustainable. Buying seasonal greens is also a really good way to go. Those are often way less packaged and of course they're also sustainable in terms of impact because they're grown locally rather than transported from far away. Obviously you can also still recycle the trash that you do produce and generate. That is completely okay as long as recycling is not your only green action of the day. Refuse pointless plastic like freebies or balloons or free samples or badges or pens and things that you don't need and that you're probably going to throw away the second you come home. Or it's going to end up in some drawer and you're going to throw it away when you declutter in half a year. Say no to plastic straws when you don't need them if you don't have a disability that requires them. And if you have a plastic container or any plastic product for that matter, use it, use it as long as you can because waste is not waste until we actually waste it. And a lot of single use can actually be used multiple times so there you go use those things and keep using them until they have you know completed a lifespan that makes sense this was my video i hope that you enjoyed it this was the impact of plastic there are of course so much more stuff to go over i'm sure that i did not get everything in this video i'm going to turn off this camera and then think of 15 other things to say i mean i just know that's going to be it but i hope that you still liked it i hope this gave you an overview and just generally more courage to get into that sustainability lifestyle yo and of course remember to like this video that would make my day See you guys next time. Have a really good time and stay safe. Bye!
Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys help me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye!